stopping in again really good to be back um i apologize for my messy background it's been kind of a week so or two weeks um but i'm really glad to be here again and kind of keep going with um animal farm see what happens with the farm and the animals and how they treat each other so it's gonna be uh interesting to read um yeah, I'm not really prepared again, but here I am and I'm gonna improvise because that's what I do apparently. Second uh, stream and all. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm here, I'm alive. And let's see who else is here with me because you guys are awesome. Jack Tar Lad, hey, what's up? I uh, saw you had your show, so. That'll be fun. I was working and could not stop by. Maybe next time. And I did not need to hit that again. But thank you for swinging in. <clears throat> and we have Legatus. Hello, my friend. Thanks for coming again. Really glad to see you guys. Hey, MSK. What's up? No, I'm not going to wear a bikini. But I'll give you props for your determination, sir. Dom, what's up, man? Good to see you. I'm so glad that you're here. You're such a great support. I appreciate it. All of you are. <sighs> like Gravy D here. Hello. How's it going? I did see you corrected yourself to Animal Farm when I uh, saw that come in. Well done. <laughs> CJ, hey, what's up? I don't remember if you were able to catch it live last time. So good to see you either way. <laughs> And Blue Cord Devil, hello, hello. Good to see you here. Hopefully you got the notification this time. Kel, no, you are not late, technically. I think I was a minute late, so way to go me. <clears throat> hey, Sam. You're awesome. Glad you're here and able to make it. This is, this is a good way to hit the like button. I like it, sir. <laughs> And Iron Oxide, what's up, man? 
Glad to see you here. And hello to Cell. I'm sorry, her phone's dead. She should probably think about charging it maybe. <laughs> yes, definitely no bikini. Sorry, blue-eyed Scorpio. <laughs> Hey, Static. What's up? Thanks for coming by. Good to see ya. That's not the one I wanted to click. Hello, Paul. How's it going? Thank you. If you're still here, feel free to watch it on the replay and listen while you drive around if need be. I highly doubt this gravy. But it would be funny to see, so... <laughs> I do apologize. I have allergies and it's that time of year. So I might uh, take some extra water or um, suck on a cough drop. So I apologize if I end up coughing or having to pause a couple of extra times um, while I'm reading. But let's see how much y'all remember. Uh because I might have forgotten a few things. Good to know, Sam. Thank you for letting letting the chat and everybody know. It's great. It's lovely. Um, I kind of tried before the stream to go through uh, the last chapter so I could at least remember, but I did uh, remember a lot of it with um, the pigs kind of one uh, one of them taking the little ones aside so he can indoctrinate them into his worldview versus, so that was Napoleon, I think, is his name. Yep, Napoleon. Um, and then Snowball did all the committees with his re-education camp or whatever he wanted to call it. So uh, that was interesting. Um, I kind of want to see that one workhorse. I want to see his his arc because I feel like it's going to be interesting because um, he's doing a lot of the work without complaint. And I feel like there's going to be a lot of people who start to complain. Boxer. Boxer and Clover. Uh, yeah, I feel like there's going to be people that start to complain and he's going to get tired of it. But I could be wrong, obviously. But and then uh, I rethought my uh, my thoughts on the Molly pretty girl horse. I feel like she's going to start manipulating people. And if she doesn't, I also kind of lean towards uh, they're going to like chop off all of her hair and take away her vanity because she's not. Uh, what's the word? Following the rules, I guess. Assimilating? Assimilating. That's what I was thinking of. So, hey, Prof. Good to see ya. Yeah, I'm back at it for now. Um, uh, some of you might know, some of you might not. My brother had to have kind of an emergency surgery. So uh, that's why I was out last week. Um, and he's in recovery. So it's kind of um, touchy when I can and can't be on stream. So um, I, I wanted to get this one in so I could at least... Um, do something and kind of relax a little bit. And my mom's with him at the hospital now, so I don't have to be there all the time like I did last week ish over the weekend and stuff. So yeah. Uh, what do you say we uh, get to it? Everybody sound good? I think we probably should. And looks like we're starting at chapter four. We went through the first three in the intro last week, or two weeks ago, sorry. So let's get started. By the late summer, the news of what had happened on Animal Farm had spread across half the county. Every day, Snowball and Napoleon sent out flights of pigeons whose instructions were to mingle with the animals on neighboring farms, tell them the story of the rebellion, and teach them the tune of Beasts of England. Most of this time, Mr. Jones had spent sitting in the tap room of the Red Lion at w Willingdon, 
complaining to anyone who would listen of the monstrous injustice he had suffered in being turned out of his property by a pack of good-for-nothing animals. The other farmers sympathized in principle, but they did not at first give him much help. At heart, each of them was secretly wondering whether he could not somehow turn Jones's mis misfortune to his own advantage. It was lucky that the owners of the two farms which adjoined Animal Farm were on permanently bad terms. One of them, which was named Foxwood, was a large neglected old fashioned farm, much overgrown by woodland with all its pastures worn out and its hedges in a disgraceful condition. Its owner, Mr. Pilkington, was an easygoing gentleman farmer who spent most of his time in fishing or hunting according to the season. The other farm, which was called Pinchfield, was smaller and better kept. Its owner was a Mr. Frederick, a tough, shrewd man, perpetually involved in lawsuits and with a name for driving hard bargains. These two disliked each other so much that it was difficult for them to come to any agreement, even in defense of their own interests. Nevertheless, they were both thoroughly frightened by the rebellion on Animal Farm and very anxious to prevent their own animals from learning too much about it. At first, they pretended to laugh, to scorn the idea of animals managing a farm for themselves. The whole thing would be over in a fortnight, they said. They put it about that the animals on the manor farm, they insisted on calling it the manor farm, they would not tolerate the name animal farm, were perpetually fighting amongst themselves and were also rapidly starving to death. When time passed and the animals had evidently not starved to death, Frederick and Pilkington changed their tune and began to talk of the terrible wickedness that now flourished on Animal Farm. It was given out that the animals were practiced, the animals there practiced cannibalism, tortured one another with red hot horseshoes, and had their females in common. This was what came of rebelling against the laws of nature, Frederick and Pilkington said. However, these stories were never fully believed. Rumors of a wonderful farm where the human beings had been turned out and the animals managed their own affairs continued to circulate in vague and distorted forms. And throughout that, a, that year, a wave of rebelliousness ran through the countryside. Bulls, which had always been tractable, suddenly turned savage. Sheep broke down hedges and devoured the clover. Cows kicked the pail over. Hunters refused their fences and shot their riders on, and shot their riders on to the other side. Above all, the tune and even the words of beasts of England were known everywhere. It had spread with astonishing speed. The human, the human beings could not contain their rage when they heard this song, though they pretended to think it merely ridiculous. They could not understand, they said, how even animals could bring themselves to sing such contemptible rubbish. Any animal caught singing it was given a flogging on the spot, and yet the song was irrepressible. The blackbirds whistled it in the hedges, the pigeons cooed in the elms. It got into the din of the smithies and the tune of the church bells. And when the human beings listened to it, they secretly trembled, hearing, it, hearing in it a prophecy of their future doom. Early in October, when the corn was cut and stacked and some of it was already threshed, a flight of pigeons came whirling through the air and alighted in the yard of the animal farm in the, wi in the wildest excitement. Jones and all his men with half a dozen others from Foxwood and Pinchfield had entered the five barred gate and were coming up the cart track that led to the farm. They were all carrying sticks except Jones who was marching ahead with a gun in his hands. Obviously, they were going to attempt the recapture of the farm. This had long been expected, and all preparations had been made. Snowball, who had studied an old book of Julius Caesar's campaigns, which he had found in the farmhouse, was in charge of the defensive operations. He gave his orders quickly, and in a couple of minutes, every animal was at his post. As the human beings approached the farm buildings, Snowball launched his first attack. All the pigeons, to the number of 35, flew to and fro over the men's heads and muted upon them from midair. And while the men were dealing with this, the geese, who had been hiding behind the hedge, rushed out and pecked 
viciously at the calves of their legs. However, this was only a light skirmishing maneuver intended, intended to create a little disorder, and the men easily drove the geese off with their sticks. Snowball now launched his second line of attack. Muriel, Benjamin, and all the sheep, with Snowball at the head of them, rushed forward and prodded and butted the men from every side, while Benjamin turned round and lashed at them with his small hooves. But once again, the men, with their sticks and their hobnailed boots, were too strong for them, and suddenly, at a squeal from Snowball, which was the, si the signal for retreat, all the animals turned and fled through the gateway into the yard. The men gave a shout of triumph. They saw, as they imagined, their enemies in flight, and they rushed after them in disorder. This was just what Snowball had intended. As soon as they were well inside the yard, the three horses, the three cows, and the rest of the pigs had been lying in ambush in the cow shed, suddenly emerged in their rear, cutting them off. Snowball now gave the signal for the charge. He himself dashed, dashed straight for Jones. Jones saw him coming, raised his gun, and fired. The pellet scored bloody streaks along Snowball's back, and a sheep dropped dead. Without halting for an instant, Snowball flung his 15 stone against Jones's legs. Jones was hurled into a pile of dung, and his gun flew out of his hands. But the most terrifying spectacle of all was Boxer, rearing up on his hind legs and striking out with his great iron-shod hoofs like a stallion. His very first blow took a stable lad from Foxwood on the skull and stretched him lifeless in the mud. At the sight, several men dropped their sticks and tried to run. Panic overtook them, and the next moment, all the animals together were chasing them round and round the yard. They were gored, kicked, bitten, trampled on. There was not an animal on the farm that did not take vengeance on them after his own fashion. Even the cat suddenly leapt off a roof onto a cowman's shoulders and sank her claws in his neck, at which he yelled horribly. At a moment when the opening was clear, the men were glad enough to rush out of the yard and make a bolt for the main road. And so within five minutes of their invasion, they were, they were in ignominious retreat by the same way as they had come with a flock of geese hissing after them and pecking at their calves all the way. All the men were gone except one. Back in the yard, Boxer was pawing with his hoof at the stable lad who lay face down in the mud, trying to turn him over. The boy did not stir. He is dead, said Boxer sorrow sorrowfully. I had no intention of doing that. I forgot that I was wearing iron shoes. Who will believe that I did not do this on purpose? No sentimentality, comrade, cried Snowball, from whose wounds the blood was still dripping. War is war. The only good human being is a dead one. I have no wish to take life, not even human life, repeated Boxer, and his eyes were full of tears. Where is Molly, exclaimed somebody. Molly, in fact, was missing. For a moment, there was great alarm. It was feared that the men might have harmed her in some way or even carried her off with them. In the end, however, she was found hiding in her stall with her head buried among the hay in the manger. She had taken to flight as soon as the gun went off. And when the others came back, look, back from looking for her, it was to find that the stable lad who had who in fact was only stunned, had already recovered and made off. The animals had now reassembled in the wi wildest excitement, each recounting his own exploits in the battle at the top of his voice. An impromptu celebration of the victory was held immediately. The flag was run up and Beasts of England was sung a number of times. Then the sheep who had been killed was given a solemn funeral, a, hawth a hawthorn bush being planted on her grave. At the graveside, Snowball made a little speech, emphasizing the need for all animals to be ready to die for Animal Farm, if need be. The animals decided unanimously to create a military decoration, Animal Hero First Class, which was conferred there and then on Snowball and Boxer. It consisted of a brass medal. They were really some old horse brasses, which had been found in the harness room, to be worn on Sundays and holidays. There was also Animal Hero Second Class, which was conferred posthumously on the dead sheep. There was much discussion as to what the battle should be called. In the end, it was named the Battle of the Cowshed, since that was where the ambush had been sprung. 
Mr. Jones's gun had been found lying in the mud, and it was known that there was a supply of cartridges in the farmhouse. It was decided to set the gun up at the foot of the flagstaff with a piece of artillery and to fire it twice a year, like a piece of artillery, and to fire it twice a year. Once on October the 12th, anniversary of the Battle of the Cowshed, and once on Midsummer Day, the anniversary of the rebellion. And that, my friends, is chapter four. What everybody think? I myself was not expecting like the human aspect of it, at least so soon. I probably eventually would think that like there were other farms in the area, maybe discussing it, but I guess I didn't really think far ahead that they'd try to take it back and then there'd be kind of like a, a battle. <clears throat> And I definitely need the water today. <laughs> Is that where you came from, Prof? <clears throat> Hopefully your workout's going well. <clears throat> hey, SF Gaming, thanks for coming by. And Patrick, you too. What's up? <laughs> yeah, Boxer is quickly becoming my favorite. Yes, it definitely did not show their uh, merit too well, did it? Your new puppy is adorable, blue cord. Nice. I haven't read it, so it's kind of why I wanted to start with it. Since I really did enjoy 1984. I figured it would be a good uh, <clears throat> jumping off point for this. And then we can uh, move on to other books as we all see fit. I'll do like a poll on Twitter and ask you guys how you feel for the next book, which I figure is in a couple of streams from now. So, <clears throat> all right. What do you say we uh, continue on? As winter drew on, Molly became more and more troublesome. She was late for work every morning and excused herself by saying she had overslept, and she complained of mysterious pains, although her appetite was excellent. On every kind of pretext, she would run away from work and go to the drinking pool, where she would stand foolishly gazing at her own reflection in the water. But there were also rumors of something more serious. One day, as Molly strolled blithely into the yard, flirting her long tail and chewing at a stalk of hay, Clover took her aside. Molly, she said, I have something very serious to say to you. This morning, I saw you looking over the hedge that divides Animal Farm from Foxwood. One of Mr. Pilkington's men was standing on the other side of the hedge. And I was a long way away, but I am almost certain I saw this. He was talking to you and you were allowing him to stroke your nose. What does that mean, Molly? He didn't. I wasn't. It isn't true, cried Molly, beginning to prance about and paw the ground. Molly, look me in the face. Do you give me your word of honor that that man was not stroking your nose? It isn't true, repeated Molly, but she could not look Clover in the face, and the next moment she took to her heels and galloped away into the field. A thought struck Clover. Without saying anything to the others, she went to Molly's stall and turned over the straw with her hoof. Hidden under the straw was a, a little pile of lump sugar and several bunches of ribbon of different colors. Three days later, Molly disappeared. For some weeks, nothing was known of her whereabouts. Then the pigeons reported that they had seen her on the other side of Willingdon. She was between the shafts of a smart 
dog cart painted red and black, which was standing outside a public house. A fat, red-faced man in check breeches and gaiters, who looked like a publican, was, was stroking her nose and feeding her with sugar. Her coat was newly clipped, and she wore a scarlet ribbon round her forelock. She appeared to be enjoying herself, so the pigeons said. None of the animals ever mentioned Molly again. In January, they, there came bitterly hard winter. Weather. The earth was like iron and nothing could be done in the fields. Many meetings were held in the big barn and the pigs occupied themselves with planning out the work of the coming season. It had come to be accepted that the pigs who were manifestly cleverer than the other animals should decide all questions of farm policy, though their decisions had to be ratified by a majority vote. This arrangement would have worked well enough if it had not been for the disputes between Snowball and Napoleon. These two disagreed at every point where disagreement was possible. If one of them suggested sowing a bigger acreage with barley, the other was certain to demand a bigger acreage of oats. And if one of them said that such and such a field was just right for cabbages, the other would declare that it was useless for anything except roots. Each had his own following, and there were some violent debates. At the meetings, Snowball often won over. At the meetings, Snowball often won over the majority by his brilliant speeches, but Napoleon was better at canvassing support for himself in between times. He was especially successful with the sheep. Of late, the sheep had taken to bleeding four legs good, two legs bad, both in and out of season, and they often interrupted the meeting with this. It was noticed that they were especially liable to break into four legs good, two legs bad, at crucial moments in Snowball's speeches. Snowball had a close study of some back numbers of the farmer and stock breeder, which he had found in the farmhouse and was full of plans for innovations and improvements. He talked learnedly about field drains, silage, and basic slag, and had worked out a complicated scheme for all the animals to drop their dung directly in the fields at a different spot every day to save the labor of cartage. Napoleon produced no schemes of his own, but said quietly that snowballs would come to nothing and seemed to be biding his time. But of all their controversies, none was so bitter as the one that took place over the windmill. In the long pasture, not far from the farm buildings, there was a small knoll, which was the highest point on the farm. After surveying the ground, Snowball declared that this was just the place for a windmill, which could be made to operate a dynamo and supply the farm with electrical power. This would light the stalls and warm them in winter and would also run a circular saw, a chaff cutter, a, ma a mangle slicer, and an electric milking machine. The animals had never heard of anything of this kind before, for the farm was an old fashioned one and had only the most primitive machinery. And they listened in astonishment while Snowball conjured up, conjured up pictures of fantastic machines which would do their work for them while they grazed at their ease in the fields or improve their minds with reading and conversation. Within a few weeks, Snowball's plans for the windmill were fully worked out. The mechanical details came mostly from three books which had belonged to Mr. Jones. 1,000 Useful Things to Do About the House, Every Man His Own Bricklayer, and Electricity for Beginners. Snowball used as his study a shed which had once been used for incubators and had a smooth wooden floor suitable for drawing on. He was closeted there for hours at a time. With his books held open by a stone and with a piece of chalk gripped between the knuckles of his trotter, he would move rapidly to and fro, drawing in line after line and uttering little whimpers of excitement. Gradually, the plans grew into complicated mass of cranks and cogwheels covering more than half the floor, which the other animals found completely unintelligible, but very impressive. All of them came to look at Snowball's drawings at least once a day. Even the hens and ducks came and were at pains not to tread on the chalk marks. Only Napoleon held aloof. He had declared himself against the windmill from the start. One day, however, he arrived unexpectedly to examine the plans. He walked heavily around the shed, looked closely at every detail of the plans, and snuffed at them once or twice, then stood for a little while con contemplating 
them out of the corner of his eye. Then suddenly he lifted his leg, urinated over the plans, and walked out without uttering a word. The whole farm was deeply divided on the subject of the windmill. Snowball did not deny that to build it would be a difficult business. Stone would have to be carried and built up into walls. Then the sails would have to be made, and after that, there would be need for dynamos and cables. How these were to be procured, Snowball did not say. But he maintained that it could all be done in a year, and thereafter he declared so much labor would be saved that the animals would only need to work three days a week. Napoleon, on the other hand, argued that the great need of the moment was to increase food production, and that if they wasted time on the windmill, they would all starve to death. The animals formed themselves into two factions under the slogans, vote for Snowball in the three-day week, and vote for Napoleon in the full manger. Benjamin was the only animal who did not side with either faction. He refused to believe either that food would become more plentiful or that the windmill would save work. Windmill or no windmill, he said, life would go on as it had always gone on. That is, badly. Apart from the disputes over the windmill, there was the question of the defense of the farm. It was fully realized that though the human beings had been defeated in the battle of the cowshed, they might make another and more determined attempt to recapture the farm and reinstate Mr. Jones. They had all the more reason for doing so because the news of their defeat had spread across the countryside and made the animals on the neighboring farms more restive than ever. As usual, Snowball and Napoleon were in disagreement. According to Napoleon, what the animals must do was to procure firearms and train themselves in the use of them. According to Snowball, they must send out more and more pigeons and stir up rebellion among the animals on the other farms. The one argued that if they could not defend themselves, they were bound to be conquered. The other argued that if rebellions happened everywhere, they would have no need to defend themselves. The animals listened first to Napoleon, then to Snowball and could not make up their minds which was right. Indeed, they always found themselves in agreement with the one who was speaking at the moment. At last, the day came when Snowball's plans were completed. At the meeting on the following Sunday, the question of whether or not to begin work on the windmill was to be put to the vote. When the animals had assembled in the big barn, Snowball stood up and, though occasionally interrupted by bleeding from the sheep, set forth his reasons for advocating the building of the windmill. Then Napoleon stood up to reply. He said very quietly that the windmill was nonsense and that he advised nobody to vote for it and promptly sat down again. He had spoken for barely 30 seconds and seemed almost indifferent as to the effect he produced. At this, Snowball sprang to his feet and shouted down the sheep who had begun bleeding again, broke into a passionate appeal in favor of the windmill. Until now, the animals had been about equally divided in their sympathies. But in, a mom but in a moment, Snowball's eloquence had carried them away. In glowing sentences, he painted a picture of Animal Farm, as it might be when sordid labor was lifted from the animals' backs. His imagination had now run far beyond chaff cutters and turnip slicers. Electricity, he said, could operate threshing machines, plows, harrows, rollers, and reapers, and binders, besides supplying every stall with its own electric light, hot and cold water, and an electric heater. By the time he had finished speaking, there was no doubt as to which way the vote would go. But just at this moment, Napoleon stood up and, casting a peculiar sidelong look at Snowball, uttered a high-pitched whimper of a kind no one had ever heard him utter before. At this, there was a terrible baying sound outside, and nine enormous dogs wearing brass-studded collars came bounding into the barn. They dashed straight for Snowball, who only sprang from, from his place just in time to escape their snapping jaws. In a moment, he was out of the door, and they were after him. Too amazed and frightened to speak, all the animals crowded through the door and, t and t through the door to watch the chase. Snowball was racing across the long pasture that led to the road. He was running as only a pig can run, but the dogs were close on his heels. Suddenly he slipped and it seemed certain that they had him. Then he was up again, running faster than ever. Then the dogs were gaining on him again. One of them all but closed his jaws on Snowball's tail, but Snowball whisked it free just in time. 
Then he put on an extra spurt and, with a few inches to spare, slipped through a hole in the hedge and was seen no more. Silent and terrified, the animals crept back into the barn. In a moment, the dogs came bounding back. At first, no one had been able to imagine where these creatures came from, but the problem was soon solved. They were the puppies whom Napoleon had taken away from their mothers and reared privately. Though not yet full grown, they were huge dogs and as fierce looking as wolves. They kept close to Napoleon. It was noticed that they wagged their tails to him in the same way as the other dogs had been used to do, had been used to do to Mr. Jones. Napoleon, with the dogs following him, now mounted on to the raised portion of the floor where Major had previously stood to deliver his speech. He announced that from now on, the Sunday morning meetings would come to an end. They were unnecessary, he said, and wasted time. In future, all questions relating to the working of the farm would be settled by a special committee of pigs presided over by himself. These would these would meet in private and afterwards communicate their decisions to the others. The animals would still assemble on Sunday mornings to salute the flag, sing beasts of England, and receive their orders for the week, but there would be no more debates. In spite of the shock that Snowball's expulsion had given them, the animals were dismayed by this announcement. Several of them would have protested if they could have found the right arguments. Even Boxer was vaguely troubled. He set his ears back, shook his forelocks several times, and tried hard to marshal his thoughts, but in the end he could not think of anything to say. Some of the pigs themselves, however, were more articulate. Four young porkers in the front row uttered shrill, shrill squeals of disapproval, and all four of them sprang to their feet and began squeaking at once. Speaking at once. But suddenly the dogs sitting round Napoleon let out deep, menacing growls, and the pigs fell silent and sat down again. Then the sheep broke out into a tremendous bleeding of four legs good, two legs bad, which went on for nearly a quarter of an hour and put an end to any chance of discussion. Afterwards, Squealer was sent round the farm to explain the new arrangement to the others. Comrades, he said, I trust that every animal here appreciates the sacrifice that Comrade Napoleon had made in taking this extra labor upon himself. Do not imagine, comrades, that leadership is a pleasure. On the contrary, it is a deep and heavy responsibility. No one believes more firmly than Comrade Napoleon that all animals are equal. He would be only too happy to let you make your decisions for yourselves. But sometimes you might make the wrong decisions, comrades, and then where should we be? Suppose you had decided to follow Snowball with his moonshine of windmills. Snowball, who, as we now know, was no better than a criminal. He fought bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed, said somebody. Bravery is not enough, said Squealer. Loyalty and obedience are more important. And as to the battle of the cowshed, I believe the time will come when we shall find that Snowball's part in it was much exaggerated. Discipline, comrades, iron discipline. That is the watchword for today. One false step and our enemies would be upon us. Surely, comrades, you do not want Jones back. Once again, this argument was unanswerable. Certainly the animals did not want Jones back. If the holding of debates on Sunday mornings was liable to bring him back, then the debates must stop. Boxer, who had now had time to think things over, voiced the general feeling by saying, if Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be right. And from then on, he adopted the maxim, Napoleon is always right, in addition to his private motto of, I will work harder. By this time, the weather had broken and the spring plowing had begun. The shed where Snowball had drawn his plans of the windmill had been shut up, and it was assumed that the plans had been rubbed off the floor. Every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, the animals assembled in the big barn to receive their orders for the week. The skull of old Major, now clean of flesh, had been disinterred from the orchard and set up on a stump at the foot of the flagstaff beside the gun. After the hoisting of the flag, the animals were required to file past the skull in a reverent manner before entering the barn. Nowadays, they did not sit all together as they had done in the past. Napoleon, the, with Squealer and another pig named Minimus, 
who had a remarkable gift for composing songs and poems, sat on the front of the raised platform with the nine young dogs forming a semicircle around them and the other pigs sitting behind. The rest of the animals sat facing them in the main body of the barn. Napoleon read out the orders for the week in a gruff soldierly style, and after a single singing of Beasts of England, all the animals dispersed. On the third Sunday after Snowball's expulsion, the animals were somewhat surprised to hear Napoleon announce that the windmill was to be built after all. He did not give any reason for changing his mind, for having changed his mind, but merely warned the animals that this extra task would mean very hard work. It might even be necessary to reduce their rations. The plans, however, had all been prepared down to the last detail. A special committee of pigs had been at work upon them for the past three weeks. The building of the windmill with various other improvements was expected to take two years. That evening, Squealer explained privately to the other animals that Napoleon had never in reality been opposed to the windmill. On the contrary, it was he who had advocated it in the beginning, and the plan which Snowball had drawn on the floor of the incubator shed had actually been stolen from among Napoleon's papers. The windmill was, in fact, Napoleon's own creation. Why, then, ask, asked somebody, had he spoken so strongly against it? Here, Squealer looked very sly. That, he said, was Comrade Napoleon's cunning. He had seemed to oppose the windmill simply as a maneuver to get rid of Snowball, who was a dangerous character and a bad influence. Now that Snowball was out of the way, the plan could go forward without his interference. This, said Squealer, was something called tactics. He repeated a number of times, tactics, comrades, tactics, skipping round and whisking his tail with a merry laugh. The animals were not certain what the word meant, but Squealer spoke so persuasively, and the three dogs who happened to be with him growled so threateningly that they accepted his explanation without further questions. That is the end of chapter five. How's everybody feeling? You awake? You alive? My voice is definitely, <clears throat> my throat is definitely dry. Oh boy, y'all have been busy this chapter. <clears throat> Make sure you keep away from the mouth. That's generally the best way to avoid them. <laughs> yes, Legatus. Technically, I listened to it, so I haven't read it. It's not off the table either. So if y'all want me to read it, I can. Seriously? Kennel? That's awesome. <coughs> Just going to check real quick. Not that I don't trust you, but you said Ryan and I know a few. So let's see here. Rock on, yeah. Ryan Kittle. Well done, sir. Hey, Shadow. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. Glad you're here. Ah, Diesel. Hello, hello. If you're still here, both of you. Thank you. Appreciate you. You guys rock. <clears throat> Hey, Andy, how's it going? Selena, hello. Ah, you're working. Well, I hope to make, help you make it through. <laughs> That's ominous, but true.
I was wondering where those puppies were <clears throat> before we got to them. So that was an interesting way to reintroduce them. What was your comment, Sam? <laughs> I'm so afraid. Please, no. Kel, I promise I'll show him better respect. I'm sorry, Sam. They suck. Johnny Five is alive or Jack Tar Lad? <clears throat> I mean, technically speaking, they both stole plans from Jones. I'm glad you're awake. Maybe. I don't know. I can read you to sleep and I'd be successful as well, I guess. <laughs> nice gravy. <clears throat> I mean, it's true. If I were cold, I'd have my Red Sox blanket behind me, wrapped around me. Never trust a Yankee. Well, in baseball. In history, you can trust us. <clears throat> All right, I think I'm going to do four chapters today. Let's see. Yeah, we could definitely swing two more, I think. All right, let's get to it. Chapter six, everybody. Click the right button and away we go. All that year, the animals worked like slaves, but they were happy in their work. They grudged no effort or sacrifice well aware that everything that they did was for the benefit of themselves and those of their kind who would come after them and not for a pack of idle, thieving human beings. Throughout the spring and summer, they worked a 60 hour week. And in August, Napoleon announced that there would be work on Sunday afternoons as well. This work was strictly voluntary, but any animal who absented himself from it would have his rations reduced by half. Even so, it was found necessary to leave certain tasks undone. The harvest was a little less successful than in the previous year, and two fields which should have been sown with roots in the early summer were not sown because the plowing had not been completed early enough. It was possible to foresee that the coming winter would be a hard one. The windmill presented unexpected difficulties. There was a good quarry of limestone on the farm and plenty of sand and cement had been found in one of the outhouses so that all the materials for building were at hand. But the problem the animals could not at first solve was how to break up the stone into pieces of suitable size. There seemed no way of doing this except with picks and crowbars, which no animal could use because no animal could stand on his hind legs. <clears throat> Only after weeks of vain effort did the right idea occur to somebody, namely to, to utilize the force of gravity. Huge boulders, far too big to be used as they were, were lying all over the bed of the quarry. The animals lashed ropes round these, and then all together, cows, horses, sheep, any animal that could lay hold of the rope, even the pigs sometimes joined in, in at critical moments, they dragged them with desperate slowness up the slope to the top of the quarry, where they were toppled over the edge to shatter to pieces below. Transporting the stone when it was once broken was comparatively simple. The horses carried it off in cartloads. The sheep dragged single blocks. Even Muriel and Benjamin yoked themselves into an old governess cart and did their share. By late summer, a sufficient store of stone had accumulated and then the building began under the superintendence of the pigs. But it was a slow, laborious process. 
Frequently, it took a whole day of exhausting effort to drag a single boulder to the top of the quarry, and sometimes when it was pushed over the edge, it failed to break. Nothing could have been achieved without Boxer, whose strength seemed equal to that of all the rest of the animals put together. When the boulder began to slip and the animals cried out in despair at finding themselves dra dragged down the hill, it was always Boxer who strained himself against the rope and brought the boulder to a stop. To see him toiling up the slope inch by inch, his breath coming fast, the tips of his hooves clawing at the ground, and his great sides matted with sweat filled everyone with admiration. Clover warned him sometimes to be careful not to overstrain himself, but Boxer would never listen to her. His two slogans, I will work harder, and Napoleon is always right, seemed to him a sufficient answer to all problems. He had made arrangements with the cockerel to call him three quarters of an hour earlier in the mornings instead of a half an hour. And in his spare moments, of which there were not many nowadays, he would go alone to the quarry, collect a load of broken stone, and drag it down to the site of the windmill unassisted. The animals were not badly off throughout the summer, in spite of the hardness of their work. If they had no more food than they had had in Jones's day, at least they did not have less. The advantage of only having to feed themselves and not having to support five extravagant human beings as well was so great that it would have taken a lot of failures to outweigh it. And in many ways, the animal method of doing things was more efficient and saved labor. Such jobs as weeding, for instance, could be done with a thoroughness impossible to human beings. And again, since no animal now stole, it was unnecessary to fence off pasture from arable land, which saved a lot of labor on the upkeep of hedges and gates. Nevertheless, as the summer wore on, various unforeseen shortages began to make themselves felt. There was need of paraffin oil, nails, string, dog biscuits, and iron for the horse's shoes, none of which could be produced on the farm. Later, there would also be need for seeds and artificial manures, besides various tools and finally, the machinery for the windmill. How these were to be procured, no one was able to imagine. One Sunday morning, when the animals assembled to receive their orders, Napoleon announced that he had decided upon a new policy. From now onwards, Animal Farm would engage in trade with the neighboring farms, not, of course, for any commercial purpose, but simply in order to obtain certain materials which were urgently necessary. The needs of the windmill must override everything else, he said. He was therefore making arrangements to sell a stack of hay and part of the current year's wheat crop, and later on, if more money were needed, it would have to be made, made up by the sale of eggs, for which there was always a market in Willingdon. The hens, said Napoleon, should welcome this sacrifice as their own special contribution towards the building of the windmill. Once again, the animals were conscious of a vague uneasiness, never to have any dealings with human beings, never to engage in trade, never to make use of money. Had not those these been among the earliest resolutions passed at that first triumphant meeting after Jones was expelled? All the animals remembered passing such resolutions, or at least they thought that they remembered it. <clears throat> the four young pigs who had protested when Napoleon abolished the meetings raised their voices timidly, but they were promptly silenced by a tremendous growling from the dogs. Then, as usual, the sheep broke into four legs good, two legs bad, and the momentary awkwardness was smoothed over. Finally, Napoleon raised his trotter for silence and announced that he had already made all the arrangements. There would be no need for any of the animals to come in contact with human beings, which would clearly be most undesirable. He intended to take the whole burden upon his own shoulders. A Mr. Wimper, a solicitor living in Willingdon, had agreed to act as intermediary between Animal Farm and the outside world and would visit the farm every Monday, every Monday morning to receive his instructions. Napoleon, Napoleon ended his speech with his usual cry of long live Animal Farm. And after the singing of Beasts of England, the animals were dismissed. 
Afterwards, Squealer made a round of the farm and set the animals' minds at rest. He assured them that the resolution against engaging in trade and using money had never been passed or even suggested. It was pure imagination, probably traceable in the beginning to lies circulated by Snowball. A few animals still felt faintly doubtful, but Squealer asked them shrewdly, are you certain that this is not something that you have dreamed, comrades? Have you any record of such a resolution? Is it written down anywhere? And since it was certainly true that nothing of the kind existed in writing, the animals were satisfied that they had been mistaken. Every Monday, Mr. Wimper visited the farm as had been arranged. He was a sly looking little man with side whiskers, a solicitor in a very small way of business, but sharp enough to have realized earlier than anyone else that Animal Farm would need a broker and that the commissions would be worth having. The animals watched his coming and going with a kind of dread and avoided him as much as possible. Nevertheless, the sight of Napoleon on all fours delivering orders to Whimper, who stood on two legs, roused their pride and partly reconciled them to the new arrangement. Their relations with the human race were now not quite the same as they had been before. The human beings did not hate Animal Farm any less now, now that it was prospering. Indeed, they hated it more than ever. Every human being held it as an article of faith that the farm would go bankrupt sooner or later, and above all, that the windmill would be a failure. They would meet in the public houses and prove to one another by means of diagrams that the windmill was bound to fall down, or that if it did stand up, then that it would never work. And yet, against their will, they had developed a certain respect for the efficiency with which the animals were managing their own affairs. One symptom of this was that they had begun to call Animal Farm by its proper name and ceased to pretend that it was called the Manor Farm. They had also dropped their championship of Jones, who had given up hope of getting his farm back and gone to live in another part of the county. Except through Whimper, there was as yet no contact between Animal Farm and the outside world, but there were constant rumors that Napoleon was about to enter into a definite business agreement either with Mr. Pil Pilkington of Foxwood or with Mr. Frederick of Pinchfield, but never, it was noticed, with both simultaneously. It was about this time that the pigs suddenly moved into the farmhouse and took up their residence there. Again, the animals seemed to remember that a resolution against this had been passed in the early days. And again, Squealer was able to convince them that this was not the case. It was absolutely necessary, he said, that the pigs, who were the brains of the farm, should have a quiet place to work in. It was also more suited to the dignity of the leader, for of late he had taken to speaking of Napoleon under the title of leader to live in a house than in a mere sty. Nevertheless, some of the animals were disturbed when they heard that the pigs not only took their meals in the kitchen and used the drawing room as a recreation room, but also slept in the beds. Boxer passed it off as usual with, Napoleon is always right. But Clover, who thought she rem remembered a de <laughs> But Clover, who thought she remembered a definite ruling against beds, went to the end of the barn and tried to puzzle out the seven commandments which were inscribed there. Finding herself unable to read more than individual letters, she fetched Muriel. Muriel, she said, read me the fourth commandment. Does it not say something about never sleeping in a bed? With some difficulty, Muriel spelt it out. It says, no animal shall sleep in a bed with sheets she announced finally. Curiously enough, Clover had not remembered that the fourth commandment mentioned sheets, but as it was there on the wall, it must have done so. And Squealer, who happened to be passing at this moment, attended by two or three dogs, was able to put the whole matter in its proper perspective. You have heard then, comrades, he said, that we pigs now sleep in the beds of the farmhouse? And why not? You do not suppose, surely, that there was ever a ruling against beds. A bed merely means a place to sleep in. A pile of straw in a stall is a bed, properly regarded. The rule was against sheets, which are a human invention. We have removed the sheets from the farmhouse beds and sleep between blankets. And very comfortable beds they are too, but not more comfortable than we need, I can tell you. 
with all the brain work we have to do nowadays. You would not rob us of our repose, would you, comrades? You would not have us too tired to carry out our duties? Surely none of you wishes to see Jones back. The animals reassured him on this point immediately, and no more was said about the pigs sleeping in the farmhouse beds. And when, some days afterwards, it was announced that from now on the pigs would get up an hour later in the morning than the other animals, no complaint was made about that either. By the autumn, the animals were tired but happy. They had had a hard year, and after the sale of part of the hay and corn, the stores of food for the winter were none too plentiful, but the windmill compensated for everything. It was almost half built now. After the harvest, there was a stretch of clear dry weather, and the animals toiled harder than ever, thinking it well worthwhile to plod to and fro all day with blocks of stone, if by doing so they could raise the walls another foot. Boxer would even come out at nights and work for an hour or two on his own by the light of the harvest moon. In their spare moments, the animals would walk round and round the half-finished mill, admiring the strength and perpendicularity of its walls and marveling that they should ever have been able to build anything so imposing. Only old Benjamin refused to grow enthusiastic about the windmill, though, as usual. He would utter nothing beyond the cryptic remark that donkeys live a long time. November came with raging southwest winds. Building had to stop because it was now too wet to mix the cement. Finally, there came a night when the gale was so violent that the farm buildings rocked on their foundations and several tiles were blown off the roof of the, of the barn. The hens woke up squawking with terror because they had all dreamed simultaneously of hearing a gun go off in the distance. In the morning, the animals came out of their stalls to find that the flagstaff had been blown down and an elm tree at the foot of the orchard had been plucked up like a radish. They had just noticed this when a cry of despair broke from every animal's throat. A terrible sight had met their eyes. The windmill was in ruins. With one accord, they dashed down to the spot. Napoleon, who seldom moved out of a walk, raced ahead of them all. Yes, there it lay, the fruit of all their struggles, leveled to its foundations. The stones they had broken and carried so laboriously scattered all around. Unable at first to speak, they stood gazing mournfully at the litter of fallen stone. Napoleon paced to and fro in silence, occasionally snuffing at the ground. His tail had grown rigid and twitched sharply from side to side, a sign in him of intense mental activity. Suddenly, he halted as though his mind were made up. Comrades, he said quietly, do you know who is responsible for this? Do you know the animal? Do you know the enemy who has come in the night and overthrown our windmill? Snowball, he suddenly roared in a voice of thunder. <clears throat> Snowball has done this thing in sheer malignity, thinking to set back our plans and avenge himself for his ignominious expulsion. This traitor has crept here under cover of night and destroyed our work of nearly a year. Comrades, here and now I pronounce the death sentence upon Snowball. Animal hero second class and half a bushel of apples to any animal who brings him to justice. A full bushel to anyone who captures him alive. The animals were shocked beyond measure to learn that even Snowball could be guilty of such an action. There was a cry of indignation and everyone began thinking out ways of catching Snowball if he should ever come back. Almost immediately, the footprints of a pig were discovered in the grass at a little distance from the knoll. They could only be traced for a few yards, but appeared to lead to a hole in the hedge. Napoleon snuffed deeply at them and pronounced them to be Snowballs. He, he gave it as his opinion that Snowball had probably come from the direction of Foxwood Farm. No more delays, comrades cried Napoleon when the footprints had been examined. There is work to be done. This very morning we begin, we begin rebuilding the windmill and we will build all through the winter, rain or shine. We will teach this miserable traitor that he cannot undo our work so easily. Remember, comrades, there must be no alteration in our plans. They shall be carried out to the day. Forward, comrades. Long live the windmill. Long live Animal Farm. Yeah, I'm thinking that Napoleon did it or had one of his little minions do it. 
<clears throat> you guys should discuss that while I be right back to get some more water. Sorry. My voice was starting to crack. Sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Got one more to go, too. I'm glad you guys are excited. I hope you're enjoying this. Noted, Sam. <clears throat> oh, hey, Shock. If you're still here, hello, hello. Thanks for stopping by. And Alf, hello. I was just watching Dermy play Final Fantasy. Nice. He's done arguing with Cloud then. Yeah, it was such a perfect world, wasn't it? Idealistic of them and all. Exactly. And if they don't uh, allow people to be educated and the people have an easy life, why would they want to educate themselves? They're not going to be able to remember everything. And if it's not written down or they're able to read it, never happened. They're mistaken. Nope. I wanted to start with something I hadn't read before. Doesn't mean I won't, though. <clears throat> if y'all want me to read it, I will. Absolutely a dictator, leader. Yes, the uh, the world we currently live in is very interesting, just like with 1984. <laughs> Neither will mine. Sam, you need to stop peddling these freaking lies. Cats are awesome, and you're just being a brat. I'm going to force you to love cats. Stupid freaking eldritch god. <laughs> I can never remember all these different terms, so your guess is as good as mine, the goddess. No. <clears throat> now I want bacon. Thanks, Kel. And it's not thawed, so I can't even cook it up after this. <laughs> See? <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> Glad to hear it. It's a lot of fun for me. <laughs> That's perfectly okay. I'd probably do the same thing. I feel this might be confirmation. Yes, it does. Because you're wrong. You're allowed to be wrong, but you should acknowledge it. Cats are awesome. Okay, not all cats. I shouldn't make blanket blanket statements. Female cats. Those are the ones that are pretty evil almost all of the time. Every experience I've had with female cats, except one and a half, 
has been terrible. Male cats, they're awesome and chill and they love you. So I guess Gravy just has to come in and ruin my theory, but uh, I don't care. My experience is. <laughs> you got one of the lucky ones. Um, Dogs are awesome. I'm a dog person that has three cats. So there's that. <clears throat> okay, let's see if my voice holds through. Oh, maybe not. See, I've never read anything from Lovecraft, so I just know of some things from friends, like Horror Amarada and Sam. <laughs> You're such a dick. Shut up. Or stop typing, I guess. Whatever. All right. Moving on. Or I'll argue with you all night. Let's, uh... Work on this final chapter, eh? For the evening. It was a bitter winter. The stormy weather was followed by sleet and snow and then by a hard frost, which did not break till well into February. The animals carried on as best they could with the rebuilding of the windmill, well knowing that the outside world was watching them and that the envious human beings would rejoice and triumph if the mill were not finished on time. Out of spite, the human beings pretended not to believe that it was Snowball who had destroyed the windmill. They said that it had fallen down because the walls were too thin. The animals knew that this was not the case. Still, it had been decided to build the walls three, three feet thick this time instead of 18 inches as before, which meant collecting much larger quantities of stone. For a long time, the quarry was full of snowdrifts and nothing could be done. Some progress was made in the dry, frosty weather that followed, but it was cruel work and the animals could not feel so hopeful about it as they had felt before. They were always cold and usually hungry as well. Only Boxer and Clover never lost heart. Squealer made excellent speeches on the joy of service and the dignity of labor, but the other animals found more inspiration in Boxer's strength and his never failing cry of, I will work harder. In January, food fell short. The corn ration was drastically reduced and it was announced that an extra potato ration would be issued to make up for it. Then it was discovered that the greater part of the potato crop had been frosted in the clamps which had not been covered thickly enough. The potatoes had become soft and discolored, and only a few were edible. For days at a time, the animals had nothing to eat but chaff and, ma and mangles. Anyone know what mangles are? Please feel free to tell me. M-A-N-G-E-L-S. Starvation seemed to stare them in the face. It was vitally necessary to conceal this fact from the outside world. Emboldened by the collapse of the windmill, the human beings were inventing fresh lies about Animal Farm. Once again, it was being put about that all the animals were dying of famine and disease, and that they were continually fighting among themselves and had resorted to cannibalism and inf infanticide. Napoleon was well aware of the bad results that might follow if the real facts of the food situation were known, and he decided to make use of Mr. Wimper to spread a contrary impression. Hitherto, the animals had had little or no contact with Wimper on his weekly visits. Now, however, a few selected animals, mostly sheep, were instructed to remark casually in his hearing that rations had been increased. In addition, Napoleon ordered the almost empty bins in the store shed to be filled nearly to the brim with sand, which was then covered up with what remained of the grain and meal. On some suitable pretext, Wimper was led through the store shed and allowed to catch a glimpse of the bins. He was deceived and continued to report to the outside world that there was no food shortage on Animal Farm. Nevertheless, towards the end of January, it became obvious that it would be necessary to procure some more grain from somewhere. In these days, Napoleon rarely appeared in public but spent all his time in the farmhouse, which was guarded at each door by fierce-looking dogs. 
When he did emerge, it was in a ceremonial manner with an escort of six dogs who closely surrounded him and growled if anyone came too near. Frequently, he did not appear on Sunday mornings, but issued his orders through one of the other pigs, usually Squealer. One Sunday morning, Squealer announced that the hens, who had just come in to lay again, must surrender their eggs. Napoleon had accepted, through Whimper, a contract for 400 eggs a week. The price of these would pay for enough grain and meal to keep the farm going till summer came on and conditions were easier. When the hens heard this, they raised a terrible outcry. They had been warned earlier that this sacrifice might be necessary, but had not believed that it would really happen. They were just getting their clutches ready for the spring sitting, and they protested and they protested that to take the eggs away now was murder. For the first time since the expulsion of Jones, there was something resembling a rebellion. Led by three young black Menorca pullets, the hens made a determined effort to thwart Napoleon's wishes. Their method was to fly up to the rafters and there lay they and there lay their eggs, which smashed to pieces on the floor. Napoleon acted swiftly and ruthlessly. He ordered the hen's rations to be stopped and decreed that any animal giving so much as a grain of corn to a hen should be punished by death. The dog saw to it that these orders were carried out. For five days, the hens held out. Then they capitulated and went back to their nesting boxes. Nine hens had died in the meantime. Their bodies were buried in the orchard, and it was given out that they had died of coccidiosis? Coccidiosis? I have no idea. Whimper heard nothing of this affair, and the eggs were duly delivered, a grocer's van driving up to the farm once a week to take them away. All this while no more had been said, seen of Snowball. He was rumored to be hiding on one of the neighboring farms, either Foxwood or Pinchfield. Napoleon was by this time uh, was by this time on slightly better terms with the other farmers than before. It happened that there was in the yard a pile of timber which had been stacked there ten years earlier when a beech spinney was cleared. It was well seasoned, and Whimper had advised Napoleon to sell it. Both Mr. Pillington, Hilkington, and Mr. Frederick were anxious to buy it. Napoleon was hesitating between the two, unable to make up his mind. It was noticed that whenever he seemed on the point of coming to an agreement with Frederick, Snowball was declared to be in hiding at Foxwood, while when he inclined toward Pil Pilkington, Snowball was said to be at Pinchfield. Suddenly, early in the spring, an alarming thing was discovered. Snowball was secretly frequenting the farm by night. The animals were so disturbed that they could hardly sleep in their stalls. Every night, it was said, he came creeping in under cover of darkness and performed all kinds of mischief. He stole the corn. He upset the milk pails. He broke the eggs. He trampled the seed beds. He gnawed, he gnawed the bark off the fruit trees. Whenever anything went wrong, it became usual to attribute it to Snowball. If a window was broken or a drain was blocked up, someone was certain to say that Snowball had come in the night and done it. And when the key of the store shed was lost, the whole farm was convinced that Snowball had thrown it down the well. Curiously enough, they went on believing this even after the mislaid key was found under a sack of meal. The cows declared unanimously that Snowball crept into their stalls and milked them in their sleep. The rats, which had been troublesome that winter, were also said to be in league with Snowball. Napoleon decreed that there should be a full investigation into Snowball's activities. With his dogs in attendance, he set out and made a careful tour of inspection of the farm buildings, the other animals following at a respectful distance. At every few steps, Napoleon stopped and snuffed the ground for traces of Snowball's footsteps, which, he said, he could detect by the smell. He snuffed in every corner, in the barn, in the cow shed, in the hen houses, in the vegetable garden, and found traces of snowball almost everywhere. He would put his snout to the ground, give several deep sniffs, and exclaim in a terrible voice, Snowball! He has been here! I can smell him distinctly! And at the word snowball, all the dogs let out blood-curdling growls and showed their side teeth. 
The animals were thoroughly frightened. It seemed to them as though Snowball were some kind of invisible influence pervading the air about them and menacing them with all kinds of dangers. In the evening, Squealer called them together and with an alarmed expression on his face told them that he had some serious news to report. Comrades, cried Squealer, making little nervous skips. A most terrible thing has been discovered. Snowball has sold himself to Frederick at Pinchfield Farm, who is even now plotting to attack us and take our farm away from us. Snowball is to act as his guide when the attack happens. But there is worse than that. We had thought that Snowball's rebellion was caused simply by his vanity and ambition, but we were wrong, comrades. Do you know what the real reason was? Snowball was in league with Jones from the very start. He was Jones's secret agent all the time. It has all been proved by documents which he left behind him and which we have only just discovered. To my mind, this explains a great deal, comrades. Did we not see for ourselves how he attempted, fortunately without success, to get us defeated and destroyed at the Battle of the Cowshed? The animals were stupefied. This was a wickedness far outdoing Snowball's destruction of the windmill, but it was some minutes before they could fully take it in. They all remembered, or thought they remembered, how they had seen Snowball charging ahead of them at the Battle of the Cowshed, how he had rallied and encouraged, encouraged them at every turn, and how he had not paused for an instant, even when the pellets from Jones's gun had wounded his back. At first, it was a little difficult to see how this fitted in with his, with his being on Jones's side. Even Boxer, who seldom asked questions, was puzzled. He lay down, tucked his four hoofs beneath him, shut his eyes, and with a hard effort, managed to formulate his thoughts. I do not believe that, he said. Snowball fought bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed. I saw him myself. Did we not give him Animal Hero first class immediately afterwards? That was our mistake, comrade. For we know now, it is all written down in the secret documents that we have found. That, that in reality, he was trying to lure us to our doom. But he was wounded, said Boxer. We all saw him running with blood. That was part of the arrangement, cried Squealer. Jones's shot only grazed him. I could show you this in his own writing if you were able to read it. The plot was for Snowball, at the critical moment, to give the signal for flight and leave the field to the enemy. And he very nearly succeeded. I will even say, comrades, he would have succeeded if it had not been for our heroic leader, Comrade Napoleon. Do you not remember how, just at the moment when Jones and his men had got inside the yard, Snowball suddenly turned and fled and many animals followed him? And do you not remember, too, that it was just at that moment when panic was spreading and all seemed lost, that Comrade Napoleon sprang forward with the cry of death to humanity and sank his teeth in Jones's leg? Surely you remember that, comrades, exclaimed Squealer, frisking from side to side. Now, when Squealer described the scene so graphically, it seemed to the animals that they did remember it. At any rate, they remembered that at the critical moment of the battle, Snowball had turned to flee, but Boxer was still a little uneasy. I do not believe that Snowball was a traitor at the beginning, he said finally. What he has done since is different, but I believe that at the Battle of the Cowshed, he was a good comrade. Our leader, Comrade Napoleon, announced Squealer, speaking very slowly and firmly, has stated categorically, categorically, comrade, that Snowball was Jones's agent from the very beginning, yes, and from long before the rebellion was ever thought of. Ah, that is different, said Boxer. If Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be right. That is the true spirit, comrade, cried Squealer, but it was noticed he cast a very ugly look at Boxer with his little twinkling eyes. He turned to go, then paused and added impressively, I warn every animal on this farm to keep his eyes very wide open, for we have reason to think that some of Snowball's secret agents are lurking among us at this moment. Four days later, in the late afternoon, Napoleon ordered all the animals to assemble in the yard. When they were all gathered together, Napoleon emerged from the farmhouse wearing both his medals, where he had recently awarded himself Animal Hero First Class and Animal Hero Second Class. With his nine huge dogs frisking round him and uttering growls that sent shivers down all the animals' spines. They all cowered silently in their places, seeming to know in advance that some terrible thing was about to happen. Napoleon stood sternly surveying his audience. Then he uttered a high-pitched whimper. 
Immediately, the dogs bounded forward, seized four of the pigs by the ear and dragged them, squealing with pain and terror, to Napoleon's feet. The pig's ears were bleeding, the dogs had tasted blood, and for a few moments they appeared to go quite mad. To the amazement of everybody, three of them flung themselves upon Boxer. Boxer saw them coming and put out his great hoof, caught a dog in midair, and pinned him to the ground. The dog shrieked for mercy and the other two fled with their tails between their legs. Boxer looked at Napoleon to know whether he should crush the dog to death or let it go. Napoleon appeared to change countenance and sharply ordered Boxer to let the dog go. Whereat Boxer lifted his hoof and the dog slunk away, bruised and howling. Presently, the tumult died down. The four pigs waited, trembling, with guilt written on every line of their countenances. Napoleon now called upon them to confess their crimes. They were the same four pigs as had protested when Napoleon abolished the Sunday meetings. Without any further prompting, they confessed that they had been secretly in touch with Snowball ever since his expulsion, that they had collaborated with him in destroying the windmill, and that they had entered into an agreement with him to hand over Animal Farm to Mr. Frederick. They added that Snowball had privately admitted to them that he had been Jones's secret agent for years past. When they had finished their confession, the dogs promptly tore their throats out, and in a terrible voice, Napoleon demanded whether any other animal had anything to confess. The three hens who had been the ringleaders in the intent attempted rebellion over the eggs now came forward and stated that Snowball had appeared to them in a dream and incited, incited them to disobey Napoleon's orders. They too were slaughtered. Then a goose came forward and confessed to having secreted six ears of corn during the last year's harvest and eaten them in the night. Then a sheep confessed to having urinated in the drinking pool, urged to do this, so she said, by Snowball, and two other sheep confessed to having murdered an old ram, an especially devoted follower of Napoleon, by chasing him round and round a bonfire when he was suffering from a cough. They were all slain on the spot. And so the tale of confessions and executions went on, until there was a pile of corpses lying before Napoleon's feet, and the air was heavy with the smell of blood, which had been unknown there since the expulsion of Jones. When it was all over, the remaining animals, except for the pigs and dogs, crept away in, in a body. They were shaken and miserable. They did not know which was more shocking, the treachery of the animals who had leagued themselves with Snowball, or the cruel retribution they had just witnessed. In the old days, there had often been scenes of bloodshed equally terrible, but it seemed to all of them that it was far worse now that it was happening among themselves. Since Jones had left the farm until today, no animal had killed another animal. Not even a rat had been killed. They had made their way onto the little knoll where the half-finished windmill stood, and with one accord they all lay down as though huddling together for warmth. Clover, Muriel, Benjamin, the, the cows, the sheep, and a whole flock of geese and hens. Everyone, indeed, except the cat, who had suddenly disappeared just before Napoleon ordered the animals to assemble. For some time, nobody spoke. Only Boxer remained on his feet. He fidgeted to and fro, swishing his long black tail against his sides and occasionally, occasionally uttering a little whinny of surprise. Finally, he said, I do not understand it. I would not have believed that such things could happen on our farm. It must be due to some fault in ourselves. The solution, as I see it, is to work harder. From now onwards, I shall get up a full hour earlier in the mornings and he moved off at his lumbering trot and made for the quarry. Having got there, he collected two successful loads of stone and dragged them down to the windmill before retiring for the night. The animals huddled about Clover, not speaking. The knoll where they were lying gave them a wide prospect across the countryside. Most of the animal farm was within their view, the long pasture stretching down to the main road, the hayfield, the spinney, the drinking pool, the plowed fields where the young wheat was thick and green, and the red roofs of the farm buildings with the smoke curling from the chimneys. It was a clear spring evening. The grass and the bursting hedges were gilded by the level rays of the sun. Never had the farm, and with a kind of surprise they remembered that it was their own farm, every inch of it their own property, appeared to the animals so desirable a place. 
As Clover looked down the hillside, her eyes filled with tears. If she had if she could have spoken her thoughts, it would have been to say that this was not what they had aimed at when they had set themselves years ago to work for the overthrow of the human race. These scenes of terror and slaughter were not what they had looked forward to on that night when Old Major first stirred them to rebellion. If she herself had had any picture of the future, it had been of a society of animals set free from hunger and the whip all equal each working according to his capacity, the strong protecting the weak, as she had protected the lost brood of ducklings with her foreleg on the night of Major's speech. Instead, she did not know why, they had come to a time when no one dared speak his mind, when fierce growling dogs roamed everywhere, and when you had to watch your comrades torn to pieces after confessing to shocking crimes. There was no thought of rebellion or disobedience in her mind, she knew that, even as things were, they were far better off than they had been in the days of Jones, and that before all else, it was needful to prevent the return of the human beings. Whatever happened, she would remain faithful, work hard, carry out the orders that were given to her, and accept the leadership of Napoleon. But still, it was not for this that she and all the other animals had hoped and toiled. It was not for this that they had built the windmill and faced the bullets of Jones's gun. Such were her thoughts, though she lacked the words to express them. At last, feeling this to be in some way a substitute for the words she was unable to find, she began to sing Beasts of England. The other animals sitting round her took it up, and they sang it three times over, very tunefully, but slowly and mournfully, in a way they had never sung it before. They had just finished singing it for the third time when Squealer, attended by two dogs, approached them with the air of having something important to say. He announced that, by a special decree of Comrade Napoleon, beasts of England had been abolished. From now onwards, it was forbidden to sing it. The animals were taken aback. Why? cried Muriel. It's no longer needed, Comrade, said Squealer stiffly. But beasts of England was the song of the rebellion but the rebellion is now completed. The execution of the traitors this afternoon was the final act. The enemy, both external and internal, has been defeated. In Beasts of England, we expressed our longing for a better society in days to come. But that society has now been established. Clearly, this song has no longer any purpose. Frightened though they were, some of the animals might possibly have protested. But at this moment, the sheep set up their usual bleeding of four legs good, two legs bad, which went on for several minutes and put an end to the discussion. So, Beasts of England was heard no more. In its place, Minimus, the poet, had composed another song which began, Animal farm, animal farm, never through me shalt thou come to harm. And this was sung every Sunday morning after the hoisting of the flag. But somehow, neither the words nor the tune ever seemed to the animals to come up to Beasts of England. Well, that is very interesting turn of events. <clears throat> Why do you think those animals confessed? And what happened to the crow? Did I miss... Something happening to the, it was a crow, right? Or was it a raven? The fanatical religious bird. I feel like I missed something or he'll be coming up soon. Allergies do suck, La Goddess, I understand. But I love pets. Are you like a reptilian person then? I'm assuming no allergies there. Most people love dogs, or like, love dogs, whatever. <laughs> yeah, but horror's reading those. I don't want to step on her toes, or tentacles, whichever. <laughs> Indeed. Large beet used as food for cattle. Interesting. Thank you, Jack. 
And if I'm mispronouncing it, feel free to advise as well. I I think I said this last time, I don't know all the words um, and I read them as I think my brain wants to read them. And sometimes I just forget to look them up and how the actual pronunciation takes place, so. Ooh, I could totally do that, Kel. That actually sounds awesome. <clears throat> False confession by one of the others. Hmm. <laughs> What's funny is I wore my uh, welcome to the rebellion uh, hat today. Hmm. Well, at least you're not a snake person. I'll give you that. <coughs> That's so crazy to me. I can't even, I can't even imagine being like that, Sam. But I guess, I mean, it, I guess it makes sense once you're under the thrall. It's true. I feel like no one talking about that religious bird means that I didn't miss something and he's coming up later. So I will shush on that part. <clears throat> All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining me for another Cooking the Books. Um, I don't know if I explained this last time, but it's uh, Cooking the Books is normally, you know, doing a uh, fraudulent things for accounting of books uh, while, you know, your accountant takes care of everything. So that's, that's where I am for everybody on their book list when they don't have time to read or they feel like they don't have time to read the books. Um, I want to provide entertainment in between chapters and discuss with y'all as well as just be able to read things that I want to read, uh, whether I've read it or not. Um, I do, I am one of those weird people that likes to reread books. Uh, so here we are cooking the books for you guys, totally legally. <laughs> well, I'm glad you stayed and you enjoyed yourself. I really appreciate all of you guys being here. Um, like seriously, this is awesome. I never thought I'd do this. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to keep it up. Yes, the parallels to current day society. It's insane to me that Orwell is like friggin' Nostradamus with this shit. And it was because he was seeing it in other countries way back then. And I hate that history is rhyming within our own country now. Not to get like too political or anything, but it's kind of inevitable, inevitable with a book like this. Thank gravy. Yep, see it, knife hands. I, I'll probably be able to make it tonight. So um, with that, uh, just pay attention to my Twitter, y'all, if you don't follow me. Um, I'll try to post maybe more in the community tabs on the channel here. Um, but mostly I post on Twitter where I'll be. I realized I didn't really do an outro or anything last time. I kind of just shut the stream down. So uh, work in progress here for me. Um, but with that noted, um, I'll see you guys in the matrix. Have a good night, everybody.